Hi everybody, uh, Micah here welcoming you to our Wednesday night Eugene First Youth Service. Uh, really excited and happy to have you here with us. Thank you so much for taking some time out of your important day to spend uh, in the Word of the Lord and uh, joining us here tonight. Uh, I'd like to take this time to uh, just let you know that tonight's message is going to be found in Genesis chapter 25. So now would be a really great time to stop what you're doing and grab your Bible or open your Bible app and be prepared uh, in the Word of the Lord for Genesis chapter 25. Um, second of all, I just would like to say um, it'd be great if you could limit the distractions that you might have going on. I know that there's a lot of fun things that you could be doing um, in the background, but right now for the next 45 to 60 minutes, it'd be great if you didn't have any distractions and you gave your full attention to the Lord. Uh, last but not least, uh, I know these these Zoom meetings are fun and YouTube videos are fun, but it sure isn't a full replacement for being face-to-face, -face. and I just can't wait to see everybody in the future. All right, here is the service. Have fun. Alrighty, hey, the next thing that we have for you guys is we have a Minute to Win It Challenge. Now we have the Menchacas. Viviana and Jose and Armando going up against BLT and James. And so they're going to have a competition. We're going to play their videos side by side and we're going to figure out who is the fastest minute to win it winner. But here's the thing is it's the mummy challenge. So they have to wrap each other up in TP. We're going to use some precious, amazing two ply TP to wrap each other up to make us look like mummies. Um, the way that we're going to uh, judge this is it's not going to be solely just by time. So you could be the first one, but you could do a horrible job. We're going to balance the two between time and quality to pick our winner. So let's check it out. Let's see who's going to win. If you guys think it's going to be BLT and, L and James, write it in the comment. If you think it's going to be the Minchakas, write it in the comment. Let's see who you guys think is going to win. Hey guys, for this next segment, what we did is we did a live Q&A with a special friend of mine. Uh, his name is Patrick Shane here. If you don't know him, you should know a few things. One, that he is the father of Malachi Shane here. Surprise, surprise. Um, he also uh, works for a company that sells granola. So if you ever need granola, hit him up. And third, um, he is an amazing, incredible person and he's got a heart of gold and just as someone that you always want to be around. So uh, this is a little live Q&A that we did with him. I just asked him some questions and uh, you can interact with his answers. If you agree or disagree, let us know. Uh, and we also want to hear some of your answers to these questions too. So check out this time with what I had with uh, Patrick this morning. Welcome in. Uh, I'm with Patrick Shane Hare. If you don't know Patrick, you should know um, that he's one of the funniest people I know. He's got an amazing mustache and <laughs> he is a, um, a surprising assassin on the football field if you play against him. <laughs> <laughs> wow. You know, that means a lot coming from you, Trevor. It's true. I am the OG surprise assassin. <laughs> Wait, actually, is it like... When you say someone is an assassin, isn't it kind of already like a surprise? Like, you know, usually assassins are not like, hey, I'm over here. It's, you're right. It's usually not on a business card. <laughs> yeah. So it's kind of the devil <laughs> negative, but it's fine. <laughs> okay. So for this segment of Youth Group Tonight, what we're going to do is I'm asking Patrick a series of questions. And he is going to answer them and give us his best why to his answer. Mm. He doesn't know any of these questions. Um, this is true. <laughs> so he's probably slightly nervous right now. <laughs> um, 
But first question is, if you were stranded on an island and you could only eat one food for the rest of your life, would it be pizza or tacos and why? I'm going to go pizza. And here's why, Trevor. Okay. Uh, pizza is bread with a mix of toppings and then it's held together by this glorious gooey melty cheese so very rarely do you have slippage um <laughs> you know things or any of the uh condiments if you will yeah so it's nice it's all encompassed in this beautiful form and you can fold it and eat it whereas a taco i love tacos but it's very rare when you eat a taco and you don't have spillage yeah i respect that and especially you know you're on the island so you got to kind of save every little bit of piece of food that you can save that's exactly right and you know you have to also think about the uh the animals and critters that are there wanting to eat all of the food scraps. And you don't want to be laying around on the beach with ants uh, and flies eating your little piece of green pepper that has fallen off of your pizza. Right, you want to feel like you're on vacation if you're going to be stranded on an island. That's exactly right. <laughs> I'm there for a reason. I would, I would add my two cents to that. And I would also pick pizza. No one asked me, but I'm going to answer anyway. <laughs> and because you get all your basic food groups right there on one, one piece. You get your veggies, you get your meat, you have your, your bread. And uh, I don't know what else is on the pyramid, but I'm sure it's there. Oh, tomatoes. <laughs> <laughs> Tom <laughs> it's, I think tomatoes do have their own part of the pyramid. You're right, Trevor. <laughs> Okay, next question is um, a little bit more, well, no, I'll just say next question is, what's something that you cannot live without? Name coffee. coffee. Okay, name two things, coffee and? Coffee and, wow, good question. Um, I'm going to go crusty bread, like a really good crusty bread. Okay. Um, now hear me out. So coffee, obviously, first thing in the morning, it's therapeutic to me. Uh, yes, sir. I've got mine. Uh, and it helps wake me up and get me ready for the day. Okay. Um, but crusty bread, I love food and I love good food. And there's nothing like having just this really, really lovely bread with a nice crispy crust and nice and soft in the middle okay. to stop up all of the juices on the plate or sauces, um, olive oil with balsamic, it doesn't matter. Just, it just, it nourishes the soul uh, and it makes me feel like a boy again. So that's. <laughs> I love it. That really makes me want to go have dinner with you once this is all over. That's right. Well, and, and how about you, Trevor? What, what are your two, two things um, you can't live with? Two things I can't live without. Um, <laughs> I was going to go real spiritual and just like shut it <laughs> <up. laughs> No, no, don't. No, um, I can't. Let's see. Two things I, I would say um, coffee would be a good one. That's that's definitely mm -hmm. one. Um, something else I can't live without would be um, oh this is so weird. Just like um, like working around the house like mm. I, I don't know just kind of getting a little bit I guess more serious. There's there's something that I just really love about. Um, just working on the house, outside, inside, just kind of puttering around. And um, I think if I were to have to live, like quarantine, live in my house uh, for the rest of my life, and I couldn't kind of work on the yard or work on this or that or do projects around the house, I that would be something I can't live without. I will say 
both of us, I know in the, like in the forefront of our mind, two things that we can't live without is our family and Jesus. But those are like given guys. Those are just things, you know, it was like, okay, next. Yes. So I, I should have prefaced my statement by saying I was, I don't know why I was just strictly thinking of food. <laughs> no, I love it. I love it. Okay. That's a good one. Um, okay. For this next question, what is the weirdest smell you've ever smelt? We had our first dog whose name was Cooper. He was a golden retriever. And um, there was a night when he was about a year old or so, maybe um, a year and a half. And we lived in this little house uh, with wood floors and he slept in our um, bedroom. Uh, and it was in the middle of the night and I woke up to this stench that was unreal and hard to put into words. <laughs> and I could hear Cooper kind of um, milling about in the room and I flipped on the light and he had pooped uh, what appeared to be chocolate milk all oh. over our, uh, our hardwood floors. Like it was everywhere, Trevor. I don't, I didn't know that he was capable of producing that much. <laughs> uh, so Dang. That, that's the winner, I think, uh, <laughs> that I can burn, burn down the house after that. <laughs> It was an option. <laughs> Just put it. <laughs> yeah, yeah that, that that takes the cake. Dude, that's crazy. Okay, since you love food, I'm gonna ask you two food questions. Okay. First one is, does pineapple belong on pizza? Oh, you know what? I I can appreciate that question. Um, my boys love Hawaiian pizza. Um. And I would normally say no. However, I enjoy it. I think it's nice to have a little bit of sweet with the savory. Yeah. Uh, so I'm cool with it. I'm open to these things. It's my favorite uh, type of pizza. Um, for you guys that are watching online, I want you to comment in the chat if you think pineapple belongs on pizza. Okay, second question is, is a hot dog, or the second food question, is the hot dog, is it considered a sandwich? Yes. Okay, I mean, tell us why. Uh, a sandwich is something that is served between two pieces of bread. And it so happens that a, um, that one edge is connected. <laughs> but who cares? Like there, it's still two very uh, distinct pieces of bread that are folded over, yeah, and encasing a cased meat, which yeah. to you know, me that's a sandwich. You know, I, I would agree with you. You know, what is the worst is when your hot dog has a blowout, and mm. that when that that piece that's all connected, that section, and then it rips open. It's like. Like, this is so frustrating. It is. It is frustrating because the hot dog is, uh, you know, it, it can squirt right out. Yeah. Especially if, if you've got your mustard and ketchup on there or relish, kimchi, it doesn't matter. Uh, yeah. You've got to make sure that that thing stays safe. That's why I try to eat a hot dog in three bites. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> You don't give it a chance to get soggy and split and, and bust out. Okay, bonus question. Do you, do you put all of your hot dog condiments on the top or are you kind of a rebel, rebel wild child and you might put some on the bun first? Yeah, I, it kind of depends on, on what direction I'm going um, for my particular dog of the day. 
So if I'm if I'm really loading it up, yes, you have to go underneath um, to to lay the base. But you you also have to be mindful of the soggy blowout that you described. So um, it's it's kind of a, a game time decision. Yeah, there are often when we're eating hot dogs, I'm eating last and I'm so hungry because I've seen everyone else eat, eat the hot dogs that I'm just like, give me yeah. mustard. And that's all I need. Yeah. Grab a couple napkins. Cause you know, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Bonus question. Okay. <clears throat> How do I say this? Um, let's just get straight to the point. Toilet paper fold or wad. Fold. Because you can get multiple, you can get multiple uh, swipes with a folded method. That's right. If, if you go bundled, it's one and done. Yeah. You've got to reload. Yeah. For all my my bundles out there, change your mind right now. <laughs> <laughs> that, now, here's the real question: front to back or back to front? Ooh. I'm back to front. <laughs> Get real vulnerable up in here. <laughs> if this is a safe place. That's right. It's only live broadcasted to the public. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this um, concludes our Q&A with Patrick and Trevor. I think we might have to do something like this again some other time. This is fun. Oh, for sure. So thanks for taking some time to be on here and um, entertaining us for a little bit. So thanks, Patrick. Thanks, brother. And love you so much, kids. Love you too. <laughs> All right. See you guys. I have a special announcement for you guys today. Uh, I talked about last week we're doing this food drive. And so just wanted to remind you guys that uh, we're going to partner with Gary McClin and One Hope and, and Cascade Middle School uh, to provide food for families who either go to or surround Cascade Middle School. And so um, what we want to do is we want to challenge you guys to collect canned goods. Um, anything that is non-perishable, you know, just think of something not like fruit or vegetables that could go bad soon, but things that um, could be stored in the pantry um, for an extended amount of time. And so the challenge to you guys is to, to collect food, whether it's in your own pantry, maybe you are connecting with your neighbors, um, you're calling them, you're knocking on their door, uh, maybe there's some family or some relatives that you can reach out to and say, hey, we're raising food to go towards these families uh, in our community. And so our goal is uh, to collect as much food as we can and we're going to pick them up on Sunday the 17th so that this coming Sunday we're going to gather it in we're going to collect it all together here's the thing that is most important if you are going to donate food to Cascade Middle School I need you to reach out to me and and let us know you know we need to know that you're going to collect the food so that we can come by and pick it up so please reach out to us confirm with us that you're going to at least have one can of food or maybe you're going to have 50 items whatever it is uh, a little bit goes a long way here guys so we want every one of you watching to participate in this and we're going to be the hands and feet of jesus in our community uh, and it is it is christ through us who allows us to be able to serve people in this way so this real tangible way that you can serve uh, and you can give back to your community. So we want to invite you to collect as much food as you can. Let's do this in the name of Jesus. All right, welcome in to this evening's message. We are week three of our series called Atypical, um, and, I, and I really feel like this one's going to be the best one yet. And I, I, I think it is one of the most applicable uh, and one of the things that we can walk away and say, okay, like I know how to better be Jesus to my family because of that message. So um, I know we've talked about it before, but I really want to encourage you guys to, uh, to focus in. And, and maybe if you're still playing video games, you could pause and put it down for now. 
Um, or if there's a lot of distractions around you, maybe find a quiet place where you can focus because I know that the Lord is wanting to speak to you. He's wanting to teach you something tonight. He's wanting you to grow and get 1% better in your faith. And so uh, I'm really excited for tonight. And the first thing that I want to do is I want to start out with a little Q&A. Kind of seems to be the theme uh, this week. And so I'm going to ask you guys some questions. And in the chat, I want you to write your answers, okay? We're all professionals at YouTube, so we understand how this works now. But um, yeah, I just have a, a list of questions that we'll go through and we'll, we'll comment them. So um, what do you think is the most said word or phrase in your home? Ready, go. What is the most said word or phrase in your home? What is the most said word or phrase in your home? The second question is, what is, what is your family's go-to meal? What, what's your go-to meal when there's, when there's like, okay, w- there's a family meeting. What are we having for dinner? You know, is it spaghetti? Is it some type of pasta? Is it pizza? What is your family's go-to meal? I think for us, the Johnsons, I think uh, our go-to meal um, is spaghetti or some type of like chicken, bake, or you know, something like that. But honestly, it's probably pizza. We're, we're pretty big fans of pizza around here. So, okay, the next question is, what's something your family talks about over dinner? What's well, like a, a common theme that you guys talk about? Um, maybe it's like your parents work or maybe it's something specific. Maybe your parents like ask you a certain question every day that you have dinner together. Uh, what is a common uh, thing that you guys talk about over your dinner table? Um, here's an, another question a little bit deeper. It, it's some, what's something that teenagers and parents fight about? What is something that maybe you and your parents fight about? What is something that a teenager and a parent would argue about? would love to see your comments below. I think for me growing up, um, it was my friends, was, you know, who, who I was hanging out with, um, you know, moms are always trying to look out for you and m- make sure you're surrounding yourself with good people. And I think I would get in arguments about who my friends were. Okay, shifting gears slightly, same theme though. What's something that you fight with your siblings about? <laughs> is, it, is it like food or uh, who has control of the TV? Um, what is the most common thing that you fight with your sibling about? Um, honestly, for me, I, I have two older brothers, but, um, we didn't grow up together. We kind of became closer when I was like leaving high school, midway through high school. So, uh, we don't fight a ton. Uh, we don't disagree anything. However, I would say the biggest one is sports, um, where, you know, you know, Dustin might think Michael Jordan's better than LeBron, um, Kyle might think that the Blazers suck, like things like that we'll argue about. Okay, a couple more here. What's, what's the most stressful thing about being a teenager? So kind of self-assessing, what's the most stressful thing about being a teenager? Let us know in the comments below. On the flip side of that, what's the most stressful thing about parenting a teenager? You know, now taking yourself out of your own shoes and putting him into your parents' shoes, what do you think is the most stressful thing about parenting you or parenting other teens? Let us know in the comments below. I think the very last question that we're going to answer and ask today is, do you have tough conversations with your family? Do you have tough conversations with your family? There, there honestly, there are some conversations that are just awkward, just straight up awkward, right? But then there are also conversations that are tough. They're, they're, they're difficult. They're things that it's like, it's not a walk in the park trying to communicate. Um, and, and I'm talking about those, those conversations you have where there's conflict and, and someone either is either hurt 
um, or they're hurting. Maybe someone has made a bad decision. And maybe it's a conversation where someone needs to apologize. It's those type of conversations that can literally be so difficult to have. So we're going to take a poll. And I have two questions for you. How often do you have tough conversations with your family members? And I'll give you some, some options to choose from. Sometimes, often, or never. How often do you have tough conversations with your family members? Members Sometimes, often, or never. And the follow-up question with that is, how much do you enjoy these conversations? Do you love them? Do they stress you out? Or can you just not do it? So how often do you have them? And then how, how much do you enjoy those conversations? Write your answers. So we've been, we've been saying these last couple of weeks that every family is an atypical family and that there's no family out there that is perfect. And because no family is perfect, every family occasionally has to have a tough conversation. Maybe those uh, tough conversations happen because of a difference. Maybe it's a difference in opinion. Uh, Maybe there's an unwise choice that somebody made in the family. Maybe there's hurt feelings, there's misunderstanding. Um, And all of those things just need to be addressed And so there is a tough conversation that needs to be had. And I want you to know that typical families, typical families, they either avoid the conversation altogether or they just do not do well in those difficult conversations. But atypical families, on the other hand, they do it differently. They approach this tough conversation differently Uh, They approach conflict and and conversations that um, can maybe bring a lot of anxiety. anxiety. They approach it differently. Uh, For the last couple of weeks, we've been saying that your atypical family, it it can be used by God. That your family, just the way it is, can be used by God to do some amazing atypical things in this world. But the, the question we keep answering is how? Like, if that statement is true, which I think it is, how do we do that? Last week, we talked about how atypical families, they pray for each other when there is conflict. Today, we're going to discover a second thing that atypical families do. So far in this series, we've met two families. If you guys remember, we met Adam and Eve the world's very first family, Um, and then we met the family of Abraham. Both of these families were atypical. Uh, They had imperfections. They were not the most um, perfect family, but they were used by God. They had their hang-ups. You know, there was uh, disobedience. There was lying. There was murder. There was conflict. There was disagree between the family Um, but that is their story and God is using it and has used it today I want to introduce to you another family this story is about a family of Isaac and Rebecca and they had two sons Jacob and Esau Isaac was actually the son of Abraham that we were talking about last week Um, and um, but Jacob and Esau is, where, is what we're going to talk about tonight. Uh, and their story isn't, is not bubbly. Their story is not one of perfection. Um, they have their own imperfections and their own struggles. Uh, you wouldn't think of Jacob and Esau and immediately think of like this brotherly tight love that they have with each other. It was an imperfect relationship from the start. But let's see how God uses their relationship for the kingdom of God. Isaac and Rebekah had twin boys. One was named Jacob and the other was named Esau. And even though they were twins, Esau was born first. So he was called the firstborn son. 
As Jacob and Esau grew up, Esau became an excellent hunter. He loved being outside and hunting wild animals. Jacob was the quiet brother. He liked to stay at home. Isaac, the dad, liked Esau better, but Rebekah, the mom, liked Jacob better. Many years passed and Isaac became an old man. He began to lose his sight, so he called for Esau, his firstborn son. Esau! Yes, father? I'm old, and I don't know how much longer I've got to live. Go, go hunt, and get me something to eat. And make sure you cook it just the way I like it. And then, then I'll give you the blessing that belongs to the firstborn son. Sure thing, Pops. I'll be right back with the biggest and best meal you've ever had. Now the blessing of the firstborn son was a big deal. It meant the oldest son would get all that the father had, much more than the other sons. Everyone knew this, including Isaac's wife, Rebecca. She heard what Isaac said to Esau about the blessing. She ran and told Jacob what to do. Listen, I heard your dad talking to Esau. He's gonna give him the blessing of the firstborn son. That means Esau will get everything your father has. Well, I'm your mother and trust me, that isn't gonna happen if I have anything to say about it. So listen up and do exactly what I say. Go out, bring me two goats. I'll make your dad's favorite meal just the way he likes it. Then you take it to him so he can bless you instead of Esau. <laughs> Sounds great, but there's one tiny problem, Mom. Esau is hairy. I mean, I mean, he's hairy like a grizzly bear. And, and well, I'm not, you know? If, if Dad touches any part of my arm, he'll find out I'm trying to trick him. And then I'll be in real trouble. Don't you worry about that. Let me get in trouble instead. Just do what I tell you. Got it? Yes, ma'am. Jacob went out and did exactly what his mother told him to do. She cooked the meal and covered Jacob's arms with goatskin to make his hands and arms feel hairy like his brother Esau. Jacob even put on some of Esau's clothes. Still, Jacob worried that his father might not be fooled by his disguise. Hey, hey, Dad. Oh, son. Who's there? Jacob or Esau? I, I can't see much of anything anymore. It's <clears throat> um, Esau. I, I did what you told me to do. But uh, here's your meal. Now, eat it up. Eat it up quick so you can bless me. How, how in the world did you find and cook the animals so quickly? Oh, well, uh, <laughs> um, uh, God just put it right in front of me there. Uh, come closer so I can touch your hands and, and make sure you really are Esau. Mm, that, that's funny. Your voice, is, it sounds like Jacob, but your hands, they, they feel like Esau's. Oh, well, <coughs> I've, I've got a little bit of a cold today, so I probably sound a little funny. Are you really Esau? Sure, sure am. Good. Now, now bring me my meal and I'll eat it. And then, then I'll bless you. Isaac believed Jacob's lies. He blessed him. The plan had worked. Jacob had cheated his own brother out of the firstborn son's blessing. When Esau found out, he was heartbroken and angry. He begged his father for the same blessing, but Isaac could not give to Esau what had already been given to Jacob. Because Jacob cheated his brother, Esau was very angry with him. Jacob had to run away and stay with his uncle in a faraway land. Wow, so... We have, we have competition, jealousy, we have deception, conspiracies, we have costumes, heartbreaks, and we have soup. We have all of these things all mixed together in one big happy family. But here's the bottom line, given everything that we just heard. With his mom's help, Jacob tricked his brother Esau into giving up something of great value. With his mom's help, 
Jacob tricked his dying father into giving him a gift that was never intended for him. And instead of owning up to his bad behavior, what does Jacob do? He runs away. He runs away and he does that again by his mother's help. Can, can you just like pause and, and just think f- and, and just imagine being a part of that family? You know, there's so much pain and deceit and corruption and cruelty all mixed together into one family. And, and honestly, I know that there are some people right now who are watching this YouTube video where your family feels like that, where your family is so funky and dysfunctional and all mixed together that you feel like you're in the midst of a chaotic family. But I just want to pause and say that it's going to be okay, that God has you and that God can use your family. I wholeheartedly believe that. But that's not the end of Jacob and Esau's story. Years later, Jacob is married and he has children of his own. But he he hasn't spoken to Esau since the day that he ran away. Now Jacob sends gifts and messages to Esau in his city. And, and, And those messengers, they come back and they... And they say that Esau is coming and he's bringing 400 people with him. You know, knowing Esau, he had every reason to hate and maybe even kill Jacob. And for that, Jacob was terrified. As Esau was coming, he could only imagine what was about to happen. But but let's actually read. Let's read how this interaction actually goes. We're going to read from Genesis 33 verses 4 through 12. Let's read it together. But Esau ran to meet Jacob and embraced him. He threw his arms around his neck and kissed him and they wept. Then Esau looked up and saw the women and children and he said, who are these with you? He asked. Jacob answered, They are the children God has graciously given your servant. Then the female servants and their children approached and bowed down. Next, Leah and her children came and bowed down. Last of all, Joseph and Rachel, and they too bowed down. In verse 8, Esau asked, What's the meaning in all of these flocks and herds I meet? And... Jacob replies, To find favor in your eyes, my lord. But Esau said, I have plenty, my brother. Keep what you have for yourself. And he says, No, please. If I have found favor in your eyes, accept this gift from me. For to see your face is like seeing the face of God. Now that you have received me favorably, Please accept the, pl- the present that was brought to you. For God has been gracious to me, and I have all I need. And because Jacob insisted, Esau accepted it. Thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you that we have the ability uh, to access your word, to hear your word, and that your word can transform our lives. Amen. So, amazingly, Esau didn't let the years of separation from his brother fill him with hatred and anger. Instead, Esau wanted to have a relationship with Jacob. It makes sense that that Jacob was so afraid to to meet Esau again, to to come back into contact with his brother. Uh, You can imagine that he was ashamed. You can imagine um, that what he, he knew what he did was wrong, uh, but he was afraid to reconcile the relationship because he thought that Esau would kill him. And honestly, you know, Esau could have done that. Esau was so powerful that he could have killed Jacob, but he didn't. 
even though Jacob had stolen everything from Esau, he could have made things right by having revenge on his little brother. But against all odds, Esau didn't show up to kill Jacob. He showed up with open arms, ready to have a conversation. Esau's willingness to have a conversation with Jacob, even after Jacob wronged him so badly, it was pretty amazing. And honestly, it was absolutely essential for them to have that encounter to be able to have healing in their relationship. So if you missed everything I said, I want to give you guys the bottom line here. Meat and potatoes of what we're talking about this week. God loves to see us living at peace with each other, but not that fake peace, right? You could walk around town and you could totally put on a show that nothing is wrong. What God wants is he wants that genuine, authentic peace between each other. There, there shouldn't be any secret hating happening from your siblings or even your friends. And like we learned two weeks ago, and we read um, in the story of Adam and Eve, God designed us to be in relationship with God and with each other. That was the original intent when God created us. And when we focus, or when we refuse to have those tough conversations with each other, what it does is it separates us from each other and it ultimately separates us from God. So throughout this series, we've been saying that if you want God to use your family to do atypical things in this world, what you have to do is sometimes you have to be the first person in your family to do the atypical thing. You have to be the first one in your family that stands up and says, this is not okay. And you have to go against what is normal, fighting with your siblings, fighting with your parents, standing up, and maybe you have to be the one that says, I love you, I don't care what you've done to me, give me a hug. Those are the type of atypical things that God is calling you to do, even in your family. And I want you guys to remember this, that not so typical families, they have tough conversations with one another. I want to give you guys just one simple tool to walk away with. One thing that is going to to help you have those difficult conversations. So here it is, it's it's six steps or it's, you know, six little things that will help you in these tough conversations. So when you're fighting with a family member, I want you to do these six things. The first one is asking what happened and how they are feeling. First one, ask what happened and how does it make them feel? The second one is being patient when they share their feelings and perspective. It's really easy to say, you know, what happened? How does that make you feel? They start talking and then you interrupt them and say, oh, no, uh, uh, that's not how it went. You know, but you need to be patient um, and listen fully to what they have to say, which leads to our third point, which is which is truly listen. You know, sit down, take a step back, ignore your own thoughts, and genuinely listen to what the other person has to say. Listen to their point of view. Because here's what happens so often is that we're so fixed on what we're going to say that we're not truly hearing what the other person is saying. So if you can pause and listen to them, it's going to go a long way. The fourth one is is be honest, okay? Which might seem simple, but a lot of times when we get into conflict, we like to make it more dramatic and we, and we don't maybe necessarily tell the full truth. So be honest with the person, be honest in what you think and feel, you know, it's not helpful if you're going to hold back information from another person. 
Um, so feel the need to, uh, to express exactly what you're feeling, even when it's hard. So the fifth thing is admitting when you're wrong. And this one's probably the most difficult because you're, you're in that conversation because you think you're right. But my best piece of advice for you is to admit that you're wrong even if you're right. Because even if you're right, being right will not solve the problem. If you can humble yourself and say, I, you know, I could be wrong and I apologize if I am. That right there is probably one of the most powerful things that you can do. And if you did that to your parents, they would be blown away and they'd probably give you candy because that's a powerful statement. Okay, the sixth thing is valuing your relationship more than being right. And it kind of ties into that fifth point is you look across that, that, you know, across from each other and you see that other person and you say, I value their relationship more than I value being right about something else. So that sixth piece is really important. Remember the relationship. Remember that person that you're arguing with and try to think long-term, bigger picture when you're in that argument with them. So I know that's a lot to digest. Um, it you know, was pretty rapid fire. I know I sometimes talk really slow. Other times I talk fast. Um, um, but I hope that you guys can take away something tonight. Um, I want to leave you with this and then we will break into our small groups. Um, I know that these conversations can be rough and they can be scary. These conversations with our families can be so hard because they have the power to either build us up or tear us down. And these tough conversations, they need to be had in families to be able to heal and move on together. And maybe you can't have those tough conversations yet with your family. I want to encourage you to have those conversations with your small group leaders, with the adults that are surrounded you, uh, and with maybe some peer mentors that are older than you. Let's start there, and then we can work to our families. So I love you guys, and uh, let's go over to Zoom and have our small group. Peace.